this is Vote Her In, a collaboration between Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. On today's episode, we speak with Laura Goose, the Mayor Pro Tem of St. Joseph, Michigan. This is Kelly, and this is Vote Her In, a collaboration between Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. We are coming to you, sadly, right after hearing about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, sadly passing away. There will, of course, be political implications, but I think I would just like to note how how sad I am as, uh, as someone who has looked up to her for many years just on a personal level. Uh, So I am going to turn things over now to Rebecca, who will introduce today's guest. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kelly. And of course, uh, we've all been crying. Uh, You know, we scheduled our wonderful guest for today, actually just a few hours before uh, Justice Ginsburg passed away. And just also very sad, but on a personal note, remembered over the weekend as my siblings and I and my mother were exchanging emails. My father and Justice Ginsburg went to the same high school in Brooklyn and um, were both at Columbia Law School. My father's a bit older. He's now deceased. But I remembered as I was talking with my siblings that way back in the day in the mid-70s when Justice Ginsburg was the director of the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, and I was sort of a young kid starting out here in Chicago, I asked my father if I could meet her, and I did. And of course, like everybody else, I've worshipped her ever since. So it's so sad, but on the other hand, we all know what we need to do, and we're going to do it. And part of that, getting it done for November 3rd, for sure, is in uh, key states for the election, one of which is Michigan, is that we have Laura Goose here with us today. She is a public official in the state of Michigan in the city of St. Joe. So Laura and I have been to know each other over the last few years, in part because she and some other uh, local uh, feminist democratic activists in Michigan invited me to give a talk first about my election day and then my book, Vote Her In. But the main thing here is we thought it would be helpful when we're just a few days or a few weeks out uh, to have a conversation with someone who's really on the ground in a key state and talk with her both about uh, what she sees and what her colleagues see uh, over the next uh, few weeks, but also about her own work here, which will continue and will be important, uh, hopefully, to President Biden. But if in some tragic way we don't have him, we all will keep working. And so I want to introduce Laura here and begin by uh, asking her a question to really share with us. Uh, as I look at her work, she's been involved in three really important efforts. One is, as I mentioned, trying to turn Michigan blue for the presidential. The second uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement in Southwest Michigan. And thirdly, and she was above the fold in the local paper the other day, so I'm very proud of her, in the effort to create a sustainable, environmentally safe communities. So we thought we would begin by asking uh, Laura to share with us how she came to her work and became an activist and why these are her priorities of the moment. So welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here, thrilled to be asked to be part of this podcast. I listen to the podcast, so I appreciate being a guest. And I do want to just pause really quickly and and also say how sad and devastating it was to hear about the passing of Justice Ginsburg um, for all the reasons both of you mentioned. Uh, And it it just feels very heavy as we go into this uh, last stretch for the presidential election, certainly. So um, we'll honor her with fighting forward. So, you know, kind of going to my background and what I'm doing, you know, when I ran for office in 2017, I I was very clear with my 
fellow residents of St. Joseph, Michigan, I'm progressive. And that when I wanted to run, that I would be focused on uh, the environment, infrastructure issues, and people. And how that would come out for people would be fair policies in government. And so all the things that Rebecca just mentioned are part of my original agenda, really. I mean, that's, it really hasn't changed. You know, when we think about creating sustainable policies, we are situated on the shores of Lake Michigan, we have a large tributary called the St. Joseph River, and both of those are large bodies of fresh water. We also deal with shoreline erosion, um, and of course, we have, you know, the need for policies that protect our community and our planet. So all of those things kind of go hand in hand and make perfect sense together. Um, on social equity and justice, you know, I told everybody I was going to represent all of our residents. That means all, which means if there's any disparity uh, among our residents of color or our LGBTQ plus community, that I would step in and be a strong advocate and ally, which I have done. And as for changing Michigan blue, I try to do my part in that as well. I am in a nonpartisan role, which sometimes does feel difficult to advocate strictly for the Democrats, but I also, when I was running and anytime I talk to residents, I don't make any question about my affiliation. If somebody asks me, I'm very honest. I never dodge that question. I'm proud to be a Democrat because I hold the same values as Democrats. And so what ends up happening though, is I talk to a lot of people that are already blue, already progressive. And so what I have to do, and I think what all of us have to do, is have the tougher questions and uh, tougher conversations with people that are either on the fence or strongly in the other camp, because ultimately we all need to come together. So I wanted to talk some about sustainability. As Rebecca noted before we got started here, we, we have some things in common, <laughs> both Gen X uh, and both, you know, care about sustainability. I have long been trying to sort of reduce my carbon uh, footprint. I've recently been on a crusade to try to sort of limit the amount of plastic that I and my family are using. But I wonder if you could talk some about, you know, uh, all politics is local. And in this case, this can be something that's hyper local, right? In, in your own household, in your own neighborhood, in your own community. What can all of us be doing to sort of think about sustainable practices? Think about, you know, individual impact isn't going to completely change uh, the course of climate change. But, but what effect can it have? You're absolutely right. It it is both hyper local and individuals won't have the collective impact that we need unless we're all rowing in the same direction. And uh, so one of the biggest things, uh, cause I actually, I not only started the sustainability committee and uh, we then went on to get an award for the Michigan green communities, the bronze level, which is the lowest level. I mean, we're, we're definitely, still in an evolution in St. Joseph, but, uh, you know, this is something that I've been passionate about my entire adult life, at least. And what I have learned is, as individuals, we have to do everything that we can to reduce our own footprint, right? So that means that in addition to recycling, because recycling is no longer really the best option for us because we just have too much of it, and we still need to do it, it's still important, but we need to reduce our use of everything. That means everything from electricity to um, fossil fuels to plastics, um, even water. We need to conserve and be less consumers and be more conservationists. And that's not easy. It's something that my family, uh, we've switched over from buying those little you know, um, Gladware or one use or, you know, maybe even a couple of use plastics to all glass containers with lids uh, for leftovers. We have gone from using plastic wrap to bees wrap. Um, you know, we have gone from all of those types of single use plastics to multi-use glass or other materials. Um, you know, I, I try to do those types of things, but then we also um, have to do things like when you travel, take your reusable water bottle, even I mean, make sure you don't have water in it when you go to the airport because 
they're not going to let you have it. Um, but you take it empty and then fill it up on your trip. That's tough because, you know, if you have kids, it's like, oh, don't forget your water bottle and stuff like that. And then as a family, you can also reduce your dependence on fossil fuels. My husband um, just traded in his gigantic truck that he had and bought a hybrid. And, uh, and then he actually ended up giving me the hybrid and taking my more fuel efficient, but larger car. Cause he's a, he's a big guy. Um, and uh, so I have the hybrid now and I'm thrilled. It's so awesome. And then our next car, when we're ready to replace the next one, will be electric. And so it's those kinds of commitments that we have. And then even more is to demand better from not only government, because let's face it, government isn't doing enough right now, but companies. We are all consumers. We purchase things. And so we need to use our dollars to demand better of companies. And so that means vehicles. That means, you know, reusable goods. Um, that means less packaging. Think about packaging, you know, and all the stuff that we that we deal with that. And then from a government perspective, we need to demand a better EPA. We need to have environmental protections at the state level and the local level. Um, and then in terms of um, at the very local level, it's pretty amazing what local officials can actually do. Now, in a state like Michigan, where our state leg legislature has done everything to try to knock the uh, breath out of environmental justice, there is maybe a few less things that we can do locally. I'll give you a quick example that will just frustrate your listeners. But in Michigan, the state legislature uh, years ago created a ban on creating bans locally for single-use plastic bags. So one of the things that we get, get asked over and over is, why don't you just ban plastic bags in the city of St. Joe? That's something you could do. Ah, but we can't because our state legislature said we're not allowed. So although that's frustrating, what we then have to do is go to our local merchants and try to make it attractive for them to get on board. So we're trying to create and have created a green partnership program that we're rolling out slowly to area merchants to try to incentivize them uh, to become better practitioners of uh, environmental causes and using you know, reusable materials. So one of the things um, I, uh, maybe some of you have figured this out, but I've been quarantining for the most part in Michigan. And so sitting here with Laura watching, as I said, on a daily basis, what local activists are doing, participating a little bit. And the Black Lives Matter movement has really taken hold here. It's mobilized, I think, some people who weren't previously committed to political or civic action. Specifically, last week, there was a really important city council meeting at which this was discussed, and Laura really spearheaded that discussion. And without getting into sort of all of the detail of the back and forth about the proposals, I think what's really important here for us and for our listeners is to understand how Laura came to be a leader on this issue. She is a white woman, and how she sees going forward uh, on this matter, you know, kind of regardless maybe of what the government may do or how slowly the government may move? It's a great question. And it's, uh, it, it was a tough week last week, I'll be honest. So just to give you kind of the really quick high level of what we've been going through in St. Joseph, uh, as with many communities in May and June, we were all uh, struck by this national movement, not only for Black Lives Matter. So in June, as a city commission, we decided to start out having social justice discussions as it pertains to our very small, you know, eight, 9,000 person community. And that's, that's not easy. We're a predominantly white community we're uniquely situated next to a predominantly black community. And we have a shared history among St. Joseph and Benton Harbor. And it's one that I'm keenly aware of. Uh, my mother grew up in Benton Harbor, graduated from Benton Harbor High School. My father grew up in St. Joseph, graduated from St. Joseph High School. And then like many people, they settled in what was considered at that point a bedroom community to Benton Harbor, St. Joseph. 
uh, less expensive housing was available there. They were a young couple. And so we ended up on the St. Joseph side of the what we kind of call the Twin Cities. Uh, and yes, I realize that we're not St. Paul and Minneapolis. However, we have some striking resemblance to St. Paul and uh, Minneapolis as well. Um, so our twin ship may be, you know, smaller, but still a very interesting dynamic. So over the decades, our shared history has really surfaced when it comes to racism and systemic racism. And it has become somewhat of a shared pain. And particularly around racial issues, it's been a form of denial, at least on the St. Joseph side. So I'll, I'll speak very specifically on the St. Joseph side. Um, an example would be, I know a lot of white people that have said to me, you know, hey, I grew up in Benton Harbor and I didn't notice any racism when I lived there. We all got along. Everything was great. And that's the thing. If you're a white person, you wouldn't maybe notice things were happening because it wasn't happening to you. And our experiences, those black and white experiences have been and are currently different not only in the United States, but certainly even in South Wales. And so when we started talking about the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and was we received a proposal from the community to put a mural on one of our streets near the high school, uh, it became, you know, as you can imagine, a, a big source of discussion. And fortunately or unfortunately, you know, we had embarked on this social justice discussion and and the mural became a big focal point of that and still is actually. Last week, we were not able to come to a decision on yes or no on the mural, but we kind of went back to the drawing board with some of the proposers and are still trying to work out a uh, go forward with it. But for me personally, it's about the unity of our two small communities. I can't necessarily solve or work on things at the national level, but when I look at as a person what I can do locally, that I think can be quite powerful. So I actually, since last Monday, reached out to two of my colleagues to get together and have a coffee and talk about how can we work on unity. And then I'm hopeful, although I'm only one vote, um, that we can, uh, or an art project of some sort in the city of St. Joseph, because we certainly do um, agree with the, the sentiment Black Lives Matter and need to show that through action and deeds. Yeah, so I, I think you're, you're giving us sort of a, a good look at, you know, what local politics looks like and how important it can be in people's lives. Why, why did you initially decide that you wanted to run for elected office? And why did you choose the the office that you chose and, you know, how, how would you then advise, how have you advised, how would you advise other women who are, are interested in running for office, looking at the landscape of, you know, offices they can run for and, and how they prepare themselves for that? Thank you for, for the question. It's, um, it was not an easy decision to run, but like many people, and I've certainly had a lot of talks with women in particular, and young people, right? Uh, I'm a Gen Xer. Um, I just celebrated my 50th birthday this year. Um, so I am, I don't consider myself young anymore. So when I get asked questions of, um, you know, true millennials or even Gen Zs, uh, I, you know, I, I often take the position of their mother <laughs> or very, very older sister, perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, devastated in the 2016 election and not just because Donald Trump won although you know certainly that was tough for me because you know a, a lot of people including myself we just were not prepared for that potential outcome and thought that that just was not possible but more than that on a much deeper level I was devastated because here we had this um, highly qualified woman um, that had done so many things to um, be accomplished and help our society. And she could not get the presidential win through the Electoral College because, of course, she did win. The and I, that devastated me as a woman and as 
you know, a person who considered herself, you know, kind of an armchair activist, right? So I hadn't been super involved, but I was always very supportive, always signing petitions, occasionally canvassing for people. And I definitely would always bring brownies to the office for the real volunteers, what I called the real volunteers. And so after that election, I literally just threw myself into our local party. You know, I went, I mean, I I did everything from set up chairs and tables to start working on communications and and pretty soon found myself not just sitting in the meeting, but also sharing and then eventually leading meetings uh, because, you know, there were so many of us that were just trying to figure out what was next. And so during that, I, st- I really threw myself into understanding what politics meant on a federal basis, a state basis, and then a local basis. And one of the things that I realized was that in in a state like Michigan, which, you know, we gave the state to Donald Trump by 12,000 votes. Well, that's, you know, like two votes a precinct or something. It's just very small. And we were just all trying to figure out how did that happen? Well, part of the way that that happened is through gerrymandering. And part of the way that that happened was through simply taking our eyes off the ball when it came to local and state politics. Our state legislature had been read for some time and really we were just focused on our our federal seats so president u.s representative and senators and if you don't have the infrastructure up and down the ballot you can quickly lose your footing and honestly your your vision for the future so um i started arguing within our party office about the need to have local races and, and, you know, having people on library boards and township boards and city commissions and um, sheriffs and, you know, all the things, because we, in Berrien County, where I live, we would have, and still do have positions that run unopposed. There's not even a Democrat running against a Republican. It's just a Republican. And when you have that situation, it's very difficult then to have pipeline or a bench for the larger positions that come up. I kept losing the one about the nonpartisan tickets. And so I decided, okay, forget it. You know what? I'm just going to run myself because I'm just going to prove that these are important. Um, And so in 2017, I threw myself into a city commission run that's nonpartisan. I won. I won by seven votes. Mm -hmm. You heard that correctly. Seven votes. And I was the third vote getter. So between myself and the second vote getter, also a progressive woman, um, there were five votes. So 12 people put two progressive women on the city commission. Um, And we displaced, unfortunately, two other women. They were both conservative and been there a long time. So, you know, you know, all fair and love and war, I guess. Um, So. I right away started in on just stuff that we talked about at the top of the discussion around sustainability and policies for equity and just kind of trying to get to know city government. And I tell that story to any woman or young person or person of color that wants to hear it because it's literally about getting the experience so that hopefully we can get the pipeline of talent that we need at the state level and then eventually at the federal level. So one of the things about this pipeline, I can see right now Laura's going to need to come back in a few months and talk some more because we're getting to the end of our time here. But you know, thinking about this pipeline and thinking about our conversation with uh, about Justice Ginsburg at the outset, I think one of the things that struck me is that all of the Facebook posts and the Twitter posts that have talked about, well, if you ever got a bank loan on your own, if you ever got a credit card on your own, in your own personal daily local life, you have Justice Ginsburg to thank, right? So in that vein of all politics is local and that vein of, for instance, losing Michigan by 12,000 votes, um, perhaps you could close uh, for us by sharing Uh, your views on what it's going to take to win in these kinds of communities, whether it's Michigan or Wisconsin or some of the other states um, that are important to a Democratic victory. 
and, you know, how you think we should mobilize and just, you know, get this work done? Boy, I wish I had a really simple answer for that. But you know what it is? And I really do think that this conversation in the context of the notorious RBG is powerful because it is about the gumption of standing up together collectively to demand better, demand better of each other, and making sure that we're taking care of each other. And I feel like in many ways, that's what she was doing her whole life was standing up. I mean, I'm sure that when she set out, she didn't think she was going to do all the things that she ended up doing. Um, And although I um, certainly do not consider myself, you know, having dedicated to memory all of her work because it's so prolific, what I do know of it is that she changed the world um, both incrementally and in a revolutionary way. Because the things that you mentioned in your question about not having bank accounts or being able to get a credit card in your own name, my mother tells me about that. When she was first married, she was not allowed to have any of those things uh, because my dad had everything. Now, they were practically the same age. They're a year apart. He didn't know any better. He certainly didn't money. My mom did all that, but it wasn't allowed to be in her name, which they thought was, they both thought was ridiculous. So then years later, not that far in the future for them, that changed because of the work of people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so when it comes to our time right now, the same is going to have to happen. We are going to have to stick together, demand that things get better, that things become more fair. And what it's going to take is literally, it is currently today an everyday slog. In a place like I live in Southwest Michigan, um, where we still are small blue dots in a red county, we have to talk to everybody. We have to get outside of our of our little bubbles that we have created, which are much more comfortable, um, and talk to people that are different than us and talk to them about how they're going to vote and why they're going to do that. Will they make calls, send text messages, send postcards to voters? Um, Because we were, we're going to need every single day up until this election and in future elections, because November 3rd is not going to change everything. So I know Kelly joins me in very much. Kelly, you want to have some thoughts on this? Yeah, just uh, my mom told a a similar story the other day about when she and my dad went to uh, buy a house right after they got married. And uh, she had credit and he didn't. Her credit no longer counted because she was a married woman. (laughs) So, uh, yes, thank you, Justice Ginsburg. (laughs) Uh Right, Um, right. But yeah, I think think that's absolutely spot on, Laura, that that we just, uh, it's all about the, the conversations right now. It's about talking to people. It's about helping people understand uh, the the real importance. I think it's more obvious than ever how important politics is in our lives, even for the people who don't want to think about politics. So, right. I think, I think that's how we win. And uh, I'm so glad you're on the ground doing the work that you do. So, yes, thanks to everyone for the hard work I know you're doing and will continue to do. And uh, thanks again to Laura, Laura, and we'll talk soon. The Vote Her In segment is a collaboration of Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.